Today, I'm gonna to be sharing my personal favorite features for functional programming in ES6. I'll also be touching on some generally helpful features that are not specific to functional programming, and then I'll go into some non-functional related features that are of limited use and some that you should just avoid completely. But who am I to be telling you all of this? Well, my name is Wolf, and I'm a barely functional dev. Sound good? Okay, let's roll the intro. I'm gonna start with a little bit of background here. So when I talk about ES6, the ES part stands for ECMAScript. And this is the standard that browsers implement in order to run JavaScript. There was a prior standard, which was ES5, and that was from an era when Chrome was fairly new and Internet Explorer 8 had the majority of share in the browser wars. So it was a while before that you know, development. Um, the original standard was going to be called ES6, which is where the name people refer to it as came from. Later, it was actually technically renamed to ECMAScript 2015, which is based off of the year that it was released, but very few people actually call it by that, just giving that for historical information. Um, and the reason why people talk about this release and this set of features so much is that this was the biggest single update ever to the standard. It was a huge deal. And in the five years since its release, support among browsers has now reached an amazing 97%. So it's essentially universally supported and everyone should be using it. There have been some newer features that have come out since then. They're not all widely as supported. So this is generally speaking, the set of features that's best to target when you're developing modern JavaScript applications. But you know, enough with the history lesson. Let's just let's go into some of the features here. So I'm going to start with a list of the features that are not specific to functional programming, but are not necessarily to be avoided. So these are just things you can look into on your own. They're generally helpful when writing applications, but I'm not going to go into any great detail on these because they're not relevant, in my personal opinion, to the functional programming paradigm that I'll be explaining how other features are related to. So these are things including default parameters and rest parameters. So these are features that allow you to decide how you want parameters to flow into your functions. They have uh, string template literals, which makes concatenating strings and doing other logic within strings easier. There's some new literals for binary and octal as well. There's improvements to regular expressions. There's shorthand for writing out properties as well. There's uh, string searching availability. There's computed property names. There's object and array destructuring, which allows you to give easily named parts of arrays and objects. There's the module system, which is a huge deal. This is something that the other ecosystem for had been coming up with different solutions to, but luckily there's now a standard way to handle importing and exporting and packaging up functionality in modules. There's typed arrays. There's some new functions on numbers for checking the types and checking safety of integers, a comparison and truncation and the sign and internationalization, localization, number, currency, date, time, formatting. There's a lot, honestly, in there. And even if all of it was useful to functional programming, I wouldn't be able to go over all of it. But I encourage you to look up more information on all these amazing features because you're going to want to at least know about them and you're going to use a surprising number of them. So the first feature that I'm going to focus on for ES6 that I find useful for functional programming is the one that's also talked about a lot, and that is new ways to specify constants and block scope. I'm not going to go into too much background on how variable declarations used to work prior to ES6, but suffice it to say, they were mutable. You could modify the reference at any time, and the scoping rules for them were less than intuitive. 
So here we have an example showing the fact that within blocks, we can have declarations of constants. There's also a syntax for variables, which is the let syntax. Uh, I encourage const just because I like using more of an immutable pattern of declaring values once and basing new values off of previous values rather than doing mutations. Your mileage may vary. And of course, if you try to reassign one of these consts, you'll get an error. So that's good. We get enforcement of that. The next useful feature we're going to talk about is arrow functions. This is another big tentpole feature that's been talked a lot about. I find these most useful when you're working with higher order functions. So things like map and filter. By the way, if you want to learn more about higher order functions, I have a video that I'll be linking. And also, if you want to learn more about map and filter, I have yet another video that will go somewhere on your screen. Uh, but so talking about arrow functions here, what we have is the ability to define a version of the function that you would pass into something like filter here, where you would take in each value and then you'd return whether you want to filter it in or out of the result. Um, and so there's shorthand for this um, besides just dropping the function keyword and using the arrow function. There's also, if it's an expression, which expressions are my preferred way of writing code. I have another video about statements versus expressions. Um, anyway, so if it's an expression where it just returns a value, then there's an even shorter syntax where you don't have to write the return statement. And if you only have a single argument, you can even leave off the parentheses so you can get real nice and concise with these things. I really encourage you to find out more about the features of arrow functions and use them all over your code. Okay, next feature for ES6 we're gonna talk about is the spread operator. This one is also related to immutability and this allows you to, when you're creating new uh, arrays, say in our first example, we take values from a previous array and we use the dot 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 operator as it's sometimes called and that will spread or that will essentially insert the elements from the array that we are using the dot 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 for and then the result will just keep adding on to that in either direction wherever you use it. There's a similar syntax that's available for the object spread um, this was added a little bit after ES6. It's not technically part of it, but it's supported by almost as many users today. And I highly encourage learning this one as well. Um, this allows you to do uh, immutable objects in a way where you start from a previous object, you spread that previous object into a new object, you do dot, 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 and then after that, you write any properties that you want to be uh, overridden or essentially you want the value to be different in the new object you're creating versus the object that you're spreading into. Okay. Next feature up is uh, this is for uh, finding elements within arrays. Chances are you may already be using this one and not realize that, wow, this was not added to the language that long ago. It seems like such a fundamental thing but this just allows you to do the find function on an array and you give it a function, a higher order function to tell it how to find and then it will bail out early as soon as it finds an element. And so this is just convenient syntax for avoiding having to write that loop that terminates early um, for iterating over each of the items in the array. So an another looping related feature that we have in ES6 is string repeat. This is one not a lot of people know about, but this is totally a thing in the language. You can use this for indentation if you, you know, know you want to add a certain number of spaces, for example, or if you just want to repeat yourself a lot. That's fine with me. Uh, next up, so now we've covered all of the features that I consider super useful for ES6. So the next set of features I'm gonna just go through pretty quickly here are ES6 features that have limited use because they're not part of the functional paradigm, but there are cases where you might wanna use these. So these are things like symbols, which give you a um, 
universally unique reference that sometimes are used as object keys that are you know, th that are guaranteed to be unique. Um, and there's some other use cases around how you use symbols. I'm not going to try and go into too much detail on those. Um, but there's cases there's cases for them. Most of them are going to be inside libraries, not very much inside application code. Next up is um, iterators and the syntax of for of, which is a nicer for loop, but it is still a for loop. So I would say generally avoid these if possible, but there will be limited use within library code or if you're writing a reusable utility of some kind and performance is a big deal for you and you decide to jump to this lower level, that's an option. There's data structures for map and set, which do have their use cases, but I would highly encourage you to stick to arrays and objects as much as possible. They are the real bread and butter of writing functional code. Uh, next step is the object.assign function. This one is almost the same feature as the object spread that I talked about before, where it uh, assigns different properties and can, uh, you know, can, can overwrite each other essentially. The difference is this one is actually a mutating function. So you give it an object and it's actually going to modify that in place and mutation, no, 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 no. I, I, except for very limited cases where, again, performance is your main concern and you're doing it in a way where it's not gonna cause you problems. So last up is promises became an official part of the standard, even though they'd been utilized in various ways before this, you know, it's now an official thing. And promises are something that are used by a lot of libraries, especially libraries that have to talk to networks and devices and things like that. So you'll end up using this a little bit when you wanna write integrations with the non-functional code, but I recommend that you write this once and then treat it like a driver that is part of your operating system and you're not gonna integrate that code directly into your business logic. Okay, last up, we have the non-functional related ES6 features that, in my opinion, don't really belong in the language. You shouldn't use them for any legitimate purpose. You can flame me in the comments if you want to talk about why these are great things to use. These are uh, the biggest one that was heralded when the language first came out was class. And let's be honest here, class is just syntactic sugar over the prototype that most people don't understand anyways, and I avoid using like the plague. So I don't really see the point. I don't really write them. Moving on. <laughs> There's uh, generator functions, which people like to talk about. They look cool and you can use them to create some really hard to read code, which I guess is cool if you're into that sort of thing. But in my opinion, there's ways to use other parts of the language that already existed to achieve the same thing. So again, I don't really get the point here and I find it to be more confusing than helpful most of the time. Uh, next up, we have uh, proxies, which allow you to intercept calls to objects and functions, and it's just a messy paradigm for programming. I generally wouldn't use it for anything. And then similarly, there's a reflection API that exists, but I've never found a good use case for this, so I would just not go there, man. Um, so with that, we're we're done with this this rundown. I I have been your tour guide on this journey through the ES6 features. Thank you for sticking with it. Uh, I wanted to close by saying uh, I did get you know comments last time that there were some technical difficulties, especially with the audio. So hopefully I did a better job this time. Let me know in the comments if there's still some issues with how I'm operating all of my equipment here that I am trying to be the best I can with. So with that, I uh, thank you for joining me. Please like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and don't forget to leave me comments about what you want to see next in the world of functional programming.